So Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, uh, welcome. I'm, I'm grateful that you are here. Um, I'm truly grateful for all your work and for the many lectures that you have put to people on, on YouTube. And I'm grateful for you being a scholar who writes uh, very eloquently and, and clarifies many, many topics that otherwise are very confusing. Um, so my name is Ali Alsam, and uh, I'm approaching you today as, as a rabbi. Uh, I'm a person who really needs counsel, uh, specifically moral counsel. And I, I would be grateful if you could help me and maybe at the end of the talk, I have some some more moral clarity. Uh, so I can say that in the in the past few months, with the events that are ongoing in the Middle East, especially the events starting with the seventh of of October, um, I have been in a state of confusion. Um, it's. Uh, to start with, it was kind of maybe a clear thing. One could look at it and say that there was a, a terrorist attack and then you sympathize with the people who were attacked. And then there was a war and um, heavy bombardment and, and, and people who are besieged and lacking in water and lacking in food. And at one stage, it, it became kind of confusing. Who am I supporting or should I be supporting anyone? And also, it became confusing if I could say something that I talk about the occupation of, of the people in Gaza and the Palestinians, or talk about the Israeli state and criticize the Israeli state for, for its policies and for its action. And... If I was to do that, would I then be an anti-Semite? Would I would I be insulting Jews whom I actually love and appreciate and with whom there is a very long history both in, in the world and in, in my country, Iraq? So today I'm I'm really approaching you, hoping that I would get this counsel and you would clarify to me topics that have to do with with who is the Jew? How can I make sure that I am not anti-Jews? It's not something that I desire for myself. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, I, was, I was born in Iraq to a family of Mandayan priests. Um, these are the so-called last Gnostics of the world. At the time of my birth, there were estimates that we were about 50,000 people, both in Iraq and Iran, living in the border areas. And, um, and I experienced, if you like, firsthand the change of, of both Iraq as a country and the change from being of a priestly family. My sister keeps saying to me that that if if history had kind of continued the way it was, I would have been one of those priests. Uh, so I was kind of intrigued by how a family that was all priests then transitioned into a family of teachers, primary school teachers, and then transitioned into the professionals of Iraq, the doctors and the and the and the nurses and the engineers and the academics. And at the time when I was born, somehow religion was a foreign thing in the family. So it, it took very little time. Also, I was born in 1969. And as I understand, the last Jews of Iraq were expelled from the country in about 1970. So I am one of the first Iraqis or the first generation Iraqi who never really got to meet the Iraqi Jews never even got to hear their names. Uh, I mean, today it, it makes me really sad that when I hear Iraqi Jewish names, uh, and these are the people who, who left Iraq and you meet them in the UK and in the US. And when I hear their names, for me, for me it's, uh, they sound as if they were foreign names, as if they've never existed in Iraq. Although these are people who can actually trace their history back to biblical time, back to the Babylonians. Um, so it's it's with this kind of background that I am approaching you. And I, I hope that you would clarify to me um, 
main definitions about about kind of th this topic. Um, so to start, for example, if I am critical of the policy of Israel, does that make me an anti-Jew? And to, to that extent, I have a few questions that I would like to ask you so that we have the definitions in place. Many of the philosophers say that if you don't know the basic definitions, then no discussion is going to be fruitful. So you have to know the basic definitions. And I know that you are kind of the right person for, for this. Uh, you are Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, uh, a scholar of Judaism, an intellectual speaker, author, and pulpit rabbi for over 30 years. You have attained an enviable place in the arena of uh, anti-Zionist public intellectuals, having constructed a unique body of work on the ideology of Zionism and its hostile relationship toward Judaism. Uh, you graduated high school at the age of 16 and dedicated yourself to full-time study of Jewish law and philosophy. Uh, and you became a protege of some of the most well-regarded rabbinic scholars in Jewish orthodoxy. Um, you also have written five books, um, and your most recent work is The Empty Wagon, Zionism's Journey from Identity Crisis to Identity Theft, which was published in 2018. And this is a book of 1,381 pages um, uh, that discusses the differences between Judaism and Zionism, and is considered by many to be definitive. Um, so I would actually like to somehow just pause with the title, which I have been kind of complimenting for a few days, because the title of the book is, is quite telling. It says Zionism's journey from identity crisis. So there was some type of identity crisis in Zionism or Judaism to identity theft. So who's, whose identity was stolen and whose identity was in crisis. Um, so if if you can if we can start with basic definitions, Rabbi Shapiro, I hope that people who are listening they know that you are the right person to ask. Um, so who who are the Israelis from a biblical perspective? Well, first, thank you, Ali, for having me on. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm gonna start with asking a question about your question, so perhaps you can clarify it. When you ask, are you an anti-Semite for criticizing Israel's policies, is there any other type of racism or xenophobia or just bias against people that you're not sure whether a opinion of yours would put you in the category or not? Meaning, is there something, and there is, it's rhetorical, just want to point it out. There's something about anti-Semitism that's more confusing than anything uh, else, other types of racism or xenophobia or just prejudice. Um, I don't think anybody would ask a question regarding whether I, uh, whether you criticize the Vatican, whether that makes you racist against Catholics, um, or if you criticize Saudi Arabia, does that make you anti-Muslim? And yet, you're asking about Israel, criticizing Israel, if that makes you an anti-Semite. What is there about Israel or anti-Semitism or Jews or Semitism? What is there in the mix here that, and obviously you're not the first one to ask this, that makes this question more of a question than other parallel type questions regarding other people? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I can tell you that suddenly my heart opened up. Uh, uh, you are really a counselor. It's it's a very good question. I mean, you mentioned the case of Saudi Arabia. So it's, it's okay for me to say Saudi Arabia has bad human rights records. And by saying that, I don't feel that I am being anti-Islam or even to say that the Islamic Republic of Iran has horrendous human rights records. 
And, and then I'm not anti-Islam or not anti the Sufis or not anti the Shia. There is something specific, absolutely, about uh, about Israel. I mean, when when one is being critical of Israel, um, you mentioned it really. You said that when you are critical of Israel, people tell you you're an anti-Semite. So the question is, why are those? Is the question, are you an anti-Semite, or is the question, why are those people saying you are? Are you confused whether the fact that people say you are something, does that make you it? See, I'm trying to first clarify the question. We have an expression in our religion, which basically means loosely translated that a good question is already half the answer. Right. You need to ask the, we need to understand the question. And what exactly is the question over here? In other words, why would somebody ask this question? What is the basis? What are the two sides? What is the basis to say you are an anti-Semite? And what's the basis to say you're not? If you don't have the two sides to the question, then you really don't have a question. What you do have is, well, people are saying this, and you would like to know why they are saying this. Am I correct? Um, yes, and and you know to be to be kind of fully open with you because I I hope that this is going to bring me some spiritual liberation talking to you. Uh, I have to say that there is some lingering fear in me that I might be an anti-Semite and I would like to purge myself from this. Um, so 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 I mean I grew up in a country that was a, an Arab nationalist country that had the liberation of Palestine as its uh, as its kind of main objective. The Iraqis, our main objective was not to build Iraq, was not to be free people, was not to create democracy, but our main objective was to liberate Palestine. And and I think there was there have been some some confusion, even some kind of brainwashing that happened to me as a child. Um, so 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 I do have that fear, just like I have that kind of worry that I might be a racist in some way. Um, so 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 I I have to kind of I have to tell you that. Okay, so let me explain. The real truth is that the question, I uh, gladly I'm going to answer your questions. The question, though, really ought to be asked to those people who call you an anti-Semite and ask them, why do you say I'm an anti-Semite? The, the question is not really, are you an anti-Semite? The question is, why are they saying you are? Yes. Um, at least in your mind at this point, you're telling me, well, I don't, Anti-Semite means somebody who doesn't like Jews. I have nothing against Jews. Yet people are telling me I'm an anti-Semite. So, Rabbi Shapiro, am I? What I would say is go to those people that are asking, that are calling you an anti-Semite and ask them why they're doing it. But I'll explain why they're doing it. The truth is they're just as confused as you are. Let's take many steps back and explain why the there's a difference between the relationship between Israel and the Jewish people to Zionists versus Saudi Arabia and the Muslim or Arab people. In order to understand this, we have to go back to the origins of Zionism and the definition of a Jew. We'll start with that. There's a biblical story where Moses receives the Torah on Mount Sinai and the Jews receive the Torah on Mount Sinai and they all say together we will do and we will obey. Um, at that point, our tradition says that we became the Jews. Before that, we were not a Jewish people. The Jewish people means the people who are required to fulfill the Torah that was given on Mount Sinai. Now, Judaism is a universal religion, which means that the entire world is obligated to fulfill it, but not everybody is obligated to fulfill the same commandments or the same statutes. 
Everyone in the world, even people who are not Jews, are obligated to fulfill seven Noahide laws, seven basic commandments. You can't kill, you can't steal, you need to follow and create a system of law. It doesn't have to be the Jewish system, but a reasonable system of civil law. You can't uh, rip a limb off a live animal and eat it. That's one of them. You can't worship idols, things like that. There are others who are obligated to fulfill 613 commandments, not seven. Now, God gives anybody the option to fulfill the 613 commandments. Uh, anybody can become Jewish. You can convert to Judaism if you were not born a Jew. And even the Jews who were born as Jews, our tradition tells us that their souls in a previous time were at Mount Sinai when God offered the Torah to the people coming out of Egypt, and those souls said, yes, we accept the Torah. God allowed us to identify those souls when they're going to be born by them being born to Jewish a Jewish mother. If, you, if somebody's born to a Jewish mother, that means he accepted in a previous life or in his soul form to fulfill the mitzvahs. He accepted it. There are those who didn't accept it, they can still accept it now. Um, anybody could be a Jew if he wants. However, if you become a Jew, you can't convert out of Judaism. Once you accept the responsibilities to fulfill the 613 commandments, you cannot change your mind. So if somebody is born Jewish, by Jewish law, he cannot change his religion. He can practice another religion, let's assume he becomes a Christian. According to Jewish law, he's still Jewish and still obligated in the 613 commandments, and the fact that he's no longer fulfilling them because he believes he became a Christian, he's violating the law because he's still bound to, the, bound to it, bound to the 613 commandments. If somebody... Oh, there's something ringing. I'm sorry. Uh, you, can yes, you yes. edit this point? I just have to yes, press yes. that button. Yep. My stove is ringing. I'm sorry. I'm home all alone, and... I need to I'll be right back. Yeah, sorry. If someone converts to Judaism and then they decide it was a mistake, it's too late. If the conversion was valid, that's it. They're stuck with it. They're stuck with the privilege of fulfilling the commandments. Now, these responsibilities, we can call them 613 responsibilities, they come with a commensurate compensation. There, there's reward in the afterlife, and the more, just like on this world, the more responsibilities you fulfill, the better your compensation. However, if you accept the responsibilities and you don't fulfill them, then there's a liability. There's punishment. It's not we punishment is a colo uh, it's a loosely translated word, but it's bad. So everybody in the world either had once upon a time or has today a option whether he wants to accept these responsibilities upon him. Um, or perhaps he says, you know what, I don't want these responsibilities. It's like getting promoted in, at work. If somebody offered you the job of, I uh, know, COO, you may say, well, I'm not qualified. For, I, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Same thing. If you want to accept the 613 commandments, you're more than welcome to do so. We don't proselytize, meaning we don't uh, push people to do it because just as at work, Nobody pushes you to accept a job that you may not be ready for. It's up to you to decide whether you're ready. But whereas at work, you need the approval of management or leadership to promote you, here anybody can promote themselves and accept more responsibilities if they feel that they're up to it, except Jews. Jews who are born from a Jewish mother no longer have a choice. Their souls already accepted it, and they cannot opt out of it. That, that's the theology, and that's the definition of a Jew. Now, if a Jew violates a commandment, everybody makes mistakes and nobody's perfect, and life's a struggle. 
Sheva Yipol Tzadik Vakam, the Bible says. A righteous person falls seven times and then he gets up. And there are two ways to interpret that. That either despite him falling seven times, he nevertheless gets up, or because he fell seven times, he learns from it and therefore he ends up getting up. One way or the other, nobody's expected to be perfectly righteous. However, everybody is expected to at least try to be perfectly righteous. Uh, nobody could get 100 on every test, but you need to try. And if a person rejects it, the Torah, a Jew, he doesn't believe. If he doesn't believe, it's different. Sinning is different than not believing. If I believe in the Torah and I understand that I'm commanded and, you know, flesh is weak and I sin, you repent, you try again, you get up the next day, that's life. But if I just say, you know what, I don't care about any of these things, I don't even believe in it, then you're not exempt from the 613 commandments, and in that sense, you're Jewish. In the sense that you're obligated, you're Jewish. But you're what we call, and I know the Muslims have a similar word, a kofar. Yeah. They have a word kefer, I think it is. Kefer, yes. Kefer. So we have a word kofar, which means basically the same thing, a non-believer. Um, and there are various other different words that describe various different levels of kefira, of unbelief. And he loses the privilege of be, privileges of uh, being a Jew, uh, but he still retains the obligations. It's kind of like if I don't believe uh, that uh, if if I if I if I'm guilty of a speeding violation, and the policeman catches me, I come in front of the judge, and I tell the judge. I really have no excuse. I wanted to get home early. It was important. My son was waiting for me. He was crying. You're guilty. You'll pay the fine. But if you tell the judge, you know what, judge? I don't believe that you have the right to tell me how fast I should drive. I don't believe in the speed limit. Then you're going to get the book thrown at you, right? Yes. It's the same thing with religion. If somebody says, you know what? I, I shouldn't have done this. I, I'll try hard next time. And he's really sincere about it. Then he's a human being. Um, and a full-fledged Jew. Even though a Jew sins, he's still a Jew. But if he says to God, you know what, I don't even believe in you, or I don't believe the Torah has any authority over me. I'm not practicing this religion. I don't even believe in it. So just as somebody that, an American, that doesn't believe the judge has jurisdiction over him, he's wrong, and the judge does have jurisdiction over him, but he's going to get the book thrown at him. He may even be considered a traitor, um, I don't know what he's going to be considered, but it's more than just somebody who violates the law. It's the same thing with the Jews. If somebody doesn't believe in the religion, um, he's considered, we'll call it a, a Jew not in good standing. I understand. For lack of a better term. I, I, okay? it, was, it was quite beautiful. If, if I may just tell you what, what as you were talking about the, the souls who were like the souls, the unborn or yet to be born mm -hmm. souls who were also present at M Mount Sinai. I got this image of uh, of the eternal being, God, who appears, and then and then suddenly time itself is irrelevant. That now for all time, the the souls, the yet to be born souls, were also present because because time itself ceases to exist somehow. Okay, that's uh, that's an interpretation. Yeah. Um, it could also be that the souls always existed in soul form, and they're just waiting to be assigned a body. Right. It's it's yes. open to interpretation. Yes. Now, here's the problem. What if somebody doesn't believe in the Jewish religious narrative that I just described? The fact is that Jews do exist. Let's go back, let's say, to Roman times and the times where they were in uh, the Holy Land under Roman jurisdiction. They're there. 
they, there were times where they had, before Roman jurisdiction, they had their own jurisdiction. They had kings, they had Saul, they had David, they had Solomon, they had a kingdom, there was a people. And yet, the only definition of these people, the only thing that makes them Jewish, as opposed to, I don't know what, Davidians, who are subjects of King David, or Solians, or Salaman Salamanians, the only thing that makes them Jews is this Mount Sinai narrative. And even if somebody did not live in uh, King David's kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Israel, or the kingdom of Judah, he's still Jewish, as Jewish as somebody that lives there. Living someplace doesn't make you more Jewish. You're Jewish if you're commanded. You're, uh, Jew, being Jewish is a job description more than anything else. God gave us a job, and that's that. And you're Jewish no matter where you are, what language you speak, what culture you have, what food you eat. None of this makes any difference whatsoever. The job description means you're Jewish. Like you're a policeman. If you have a job description that says you're a policeman, it doesn't matter if you like pizza or falafel or sushi. or It doesn't matter your culture. It, your, your, your race doesn't matter. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant to your being a policeman. And none of these things are relevant to our being Jews. But what if you don't believe in the Jewish narrative? What if you don't believe this? Now you have these identifiable group of people, these Jews. They have, in those days, they had a kingdom. Otherwise, they had their own uh, communities. They have their own customs. They have their own ideas. They have their own, they're an identifiable group. Who are they? Where'd they come from? Now, I know the answer, and I just gave it to you. But if you don't believe my answer, then what's the answer? It's a problem. It's a problem because, well, are they a family, a tribe? No, they're not. In fact, uh, according to the Jewish law, tribal affiliation follows paternal lineage. We're, we're comprised of 12 tribes. If you're uh, the 12 sons of Jacob in the Bible, if your father is from one tribe and your mother is from another tribe, your lineage follows, uh, your tribal affiliation follows your father's tribe. Um, the same thing with laws of inheritance. Family law follows the father. Um, and tribal law follows the father. But being Jewish follows the mother. So it's not a tribe. There's also no infrastructure to this tribe. There's no... There, there's no characteristics of a tribe it's not a tribe it's not a family also you can convert into judaism so it's not really a biological family it's not even a tribe it doesn't the laws itself judaism's laws itself negate the idea that jews are a tribe we're not a race they're jews of all sorts of races we're not an ethnicity there's no question that a yemenite jew is sitting on the carpet on the floor with his turban and his earring is not of the same, and smoking his uh, hookah, is not of the same ethnicity as the German Jew, right? The Ethiopian Jew is not the same ethnicity as the Russian Jew, yet they're all equally Jews. Now, we know the reason is because they happen to be obligated to fulfill 613 commandments. And to the extent that they do, that'll decide whether they're a good Jew or not such a good Jew, like a policeman. If he fulfills his duties better, he's a better policeman. That's all it is. A Jew is a job description. But if you don't believe what I said, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in Moses, you don't believe in the story, who are these people? It's a mystery. There really is no good answer. There's no, what I, that I mean, there's no intellectually consistent answer. Right. It's not an ethno-religion because that doesn't make any sense either because there are people uh, that don't believe in the religion and they're of different ethnicities. What unites them that they're both Jews? Let's say you have a, a Ethiopian atheist Jew and a German atheist Jew. What connection do they have? They don't. Neither of them believe in the religion or practice it. There's no similar ethnicity. So what what connects them? Well, Ashkenazi Jews have a similar to each other. Uh, ethnically, but they're not similar to the Ethiopian Jews or the Yemen. The Yemenite Jews are similar ethnically to Yemenite non-Jews, yes, etc. So what, what exactly is this? So that's a mystery, and there is no, no real answer. 
because the truth is that my narrative is right. Um, th this leads to this is this opens the door to conspiracy theories because this group of people, these Jews, not only they, are they identifiable by the label Jew, but they're also in many places, especially the Ashkenazim, specifically the Ashkenazim, disproportionately successful in various fields. So who are these people? It, it, the most accessible answer is it's a secret club, that it's some kind of network. Now, I know that we're connected because of God's law. If not, I mean, the only other answer is we're connected by people who believe in the God's law, but you have atheist Jews also. And you'd have to ask them why they consider themselves Jews. You ask your friend, what, 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 I don't even know what it means, a cultural Jew. He celebrates the holidays. What if, I, what, what if a Christian, a regular Christian, what if you would start, uh, you're Gnostic, not a Christian, but someone who's not Jewish, would start celebrating Passover. Does now he becomes a cultural Jew? Nobody claims that. No, and what if a Jew doesn't celebrate the holidays? He's not cultural at all. He has no connection with anything Jewish. Does that mean he's not Jewish? So you'll have a Christian guy, a regular Christian, who decides, you know, I like Passover. It's a nice holiday. I'm going to celebrate it. Um, and then you have a Jew that doesn't celebrate Passover. So now the Christian guy is more Jewish than the other guy? If celebrating a certain culture makes you Jewish, does that mean everybody who celebrates that culture is Jewish um, and whoever doesn't celebrate it is not Jewish? Well, maybe you'll say that, okay, a Christian celebrating Passover doesn't really work because you have to celebrate your ancestors' ex exodus of Egypt and the Christian didn't have the ancestors. Well, what if you don't believe in the biblical narrative altogether that the Jews ever exited Egypt? So you don't believe in it. Or what if you're, you're a convert to Judaism and now you're not religious? Okay, so your ancestors didn't even leave Egypt. You, you converted, you became a religious Jew, and they said, you know what, I just want to be a cultural Jew. Your ancestors are, didn't, really, didn't leave Egypt. Take Ivanka Trump, for example, the, probably the most famous Jewish convert around today, right? Donald Trump's daughter. Yes. Uh, she converted to Judaism. Her father, for crying out loud, is Donald Trump. She has no Jewish lineage, but she's 100% Jewish if her conversion was done properly, just as Jewish as I am. She's not adopted into the Jewish family, no. Adopted means that you're not really biologically part of the family, but the law says you have to treat uh, them like as if they were. It's not that Ivanka Trump, we treat her as if she is Jewish. No, Ivanka is 100% Jewish because she is now has that job description. Yet her family is not. Donald Trump is the furthest thing from a Jew. Um, so what, and if she would become non-religious and just a cultural Jew, what would make her Jewish? None of these explanations are intellectually sound. So now you have an identifiable group of people who are competing with other groups, and you're thinking, what is this group identity? What is the group identity? So, yeah, the fact that there are non-religious Jews and they still identify as Jews, that takes the definition of a Jew outside of the realm of the religious. And now it's very easy to say, okay, it's a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy. The Jews are a network, like the protocols of the elders of Zion. Yes. Okay. And the reason why it's easy to say that, it's more accessible to say that, is because once you have these non-religious Jews, right, and you have these all sorts of Jews that don't have the religion as a common denominator, they themselves don't even believe the religious narrative. So, okay, so what makes you Jewish? And the a, via, a answer, it's wrong, it's evil, it's anti-Semitic, but a answer that the anti-Semites use, it's a conspiracy theory. And the Jews at the same time, the non-religious Jews, have a question, why do the anti-Semites hate us? The religious Jews, most of anti-Semitism in Europe was religious persecution. 
forced conversions, inquisition, things like that. And we we killed Jesus and etc. Yeah. But after the Enlightenment, after the Emancipation, that wasn't really the type of anti-Semitism that existed. Then it, it slowly became a racial type of anti-Semitism, and which led to Hitler that said, I don't care if a Jew is religious or not. I don't care if a Jew uh, practices Christianity or not. If he has Jewish blood, we kill him. So that's not religious. So in Russia in the late 1800s, there were pogroms. And the Russian Jews were thinking, the, the assimilated Jews, they didn't want to be Jewish. I mean, they didn't want to live my lifestyle. Jewish, being Jewish is a job description, but it's the, in order to fulfill the job, you have to live a certain life. Um, I have to marry a Jewish woman. I have to eat kosher food. I have to have a prayer quorum of 10 other Jews. I, I have to live a certain way in a certain place. Extremely significant is the fact that we need to spend as much time as possible, need meaning obligated, in studying God's law, studying the Torah. And in every Jewish home, there are shelves of Jewish books, religious books. Even if a person is a doctor or a lawyer, he's going to have those books in his home. Yes. There are some that have thousands, some that have dozens, some that have hundreds, but it's a staple in every Jewish home. When somebody, when Jewish Orthodox guy gets married, uh, his in-law, father-in-law buys him customarily a shas, an entire Talmud, 20 big volumes, 20 big volumes. And it's there displayed in his house prominently, usually in a break front or in, in the dining room or in the living room and various other Jewish books as well. And you end up having to lead a certain lifestyle if you want to fulfill the law. Um, and if you want to be a good Jew, meaning you want to fulfill your job description properly, just like if you want to be a good doctor, you're going to have to work very hard and you're going to have to give up many social uh, opportunities that uh, perhaps a, 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 a regular nine to five worker would have, right? Um, same thing with being a Jew. We have a job and it's a lifetime job, but it's worth it because many reasons, one of the, not the least of which is that after we leave this world, we will exist forever and ever and ever, billions and billions of years. And whatever we investment we put into our job, that's our pension. Yes. And the more you put in now, the more you get forever. <clears throat> so it's worth it. If you ever studied for a test and you crammed, so you know for those few days or a couple of weeks, you shut off your phone, you you close out your uh, all access to you, and you say, look, I need to cram for this test, right? We are in this world cramming. Yeah, and it's not easy. We need a break every now and then. Right. But that's that's the that's the challenge of being an Orthodox Jew. That's the job. And the difference between a a successful Orthodox Jew and one who's less successful is somebody who tries harder and a higher level Orthodox Jew is somebody who succeeds, just like a higher level doctor or lawyer, somebody that's more scholarly and, and works harder. And, uh, you know, same thing with a Jew. And we we wanted to be segregated socially, um, culturally from our societies. We are loyal citizens. I'm a citizen of the United States of America. I hang out a flag on the 4th of July, law abiding, loyal to our country. Absolutely. But socially, we have freedom of culture in this country, freedom of religion, freedom to do whatever we want. Thank God for America. So we have our own, we have, we tend to consolidate ourselves in neighborhoods where we have a schools for our children or private schools, synagogues. And then if you have a good school, more Orthodox Jews will move into that neighborhood. And before you know it, you have what you call a Jewish culture, but that's just uh, an effect of Jewishness. The Jewishness itself is defined only by the law. Now, the let's go back to these people who after the Enlightenment and the Emancipation, had an opportunity to get to have freedom not only of religion, but freedom from religion. Not everybody likes this lifestyle. Not everybody wants it. In the Middle Ages, in Europe especially, we were forced into ghettos. And we really hadn't, they had no choice. The Jews were not allowed in universities. 
uh, they had a lot of restrictions placed upon them. But after the Enlightenment emancipation, no more restrictions, well, for the most part. Yes. And now they're allowed to go to the universities, they're allowed to be like everybody else, and there were Jews that took that opportunity and did it. As far as we're concerned, these Jews, well, some of them remained religious and tried to kind of get both worlds. Some of them, many of them just threw off their religion. We call them kofrim, right? Um, but, and they, many of them didn't even identify as Jews or they didn't want to identify as Jews. We're just regular Russians. We're just regular Germans. Here was the problem, though. The anti-Semites persecuted them anyway. There are pogroms in Russia that targeted even the assimilated Jews. There was anti-Semitic laws in Germany that targeted even non-religious Jews. Now that's the identity crisis. Are we Jews or are we not Jews? We don't, we don't even particularly like being Jews. A lot of these Jews, these assimilated Jews, absorb the anti-Semitic attitudes of the outside world and the stereotypes. Jews are immoral. Jews are ugly. Jews are disgusting. Jews are weak. And, and yet, the anti-Semites are persecuting them too. There's your identity crisis. Yes, I understand. We don't want to be Jews, but the non-Jews won't let us be non-Jews. Yeah. So what's going on here? That's the identity crisis. Now, the truth of the matter is that part of it is because the non-Jews who didn't believe in the Jewish narrative, in the Jewish identity of having a job description given by God through Mount Sinai, they themselves couldn't define what a Jew is. They just knew that there are these people that are different. They call themselves Jews. And even the ones that didn't call themselves Jews, that was the problem. These guys thought that if we assimilate, no one will call us, us Jews, everything. Will be. But they did. They did. So now we got to go to the anti-Semite and ask them, why do you hate the Jews if they're just like you? And the anti-Semites have various different answers. I once asked an anti-Semite, very prominent anti-Semite. I said, how do you know who to hate? Like, how do you define Jew? Someone whose mother's Jewish, father's Jewish. Do you follow the Talmudic legal uh, ways of determining who's a Jew? If a pregnant woman uh, converts, a pregnant non-Jew converts to Judaism, the child is Jewish. Is the child considered a convert and consider? We have all sorts of laws about this, about who's a Jew, just like there are laws of who's an American citizen and who's a obligated to, to be a policeman, etc. It's a legal status being a Jew. And his answer that he gave me is anybody who identifies as a Jew is a Jew. Fine. Here's the thing. You ask these assimilated Jews, well, what makes us Jew? What makes you Jewish? And the best answer they came up with, Theodore Herzl came up with this answer. And later, Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, mm -hmm. he said the same thing. Whoever the anti-Semite hates, that's a Jew. The anti-Semite creates the Jew. And I'm certain you've heard people say, well, non-religious Jews are equally Jewish because Hitler didn't distinguish between the, Jew the religious and the non-religious. The anti-Semites don't distinguish, so we're all, we're all together as Jews. Hitler is the rabbi now that gets to decide who's a Jew. The anti-Semites get to decide who's a Jew. Yeah, it's a very and sad situation. It's a very sad situation, but it's, it's bizarre because the anti-Semite says, I hate anybody who identifies as a Jew. And the, there are these Jews that are saying, "Whoever the ant I, I, I'm Jewish only because the anti-Semite hates me. So you have really no definition of Jew and no reason for anti-Semitic hate. And that is very psychologically traumatic to these Jews who are hated. Now, from a religious perspective, we have religious theology about anti-Semitism. We have a very uh, specific, robust, and tangible identity as to what's a Jew. But if you're, you don't believe the religious story, and, and then why do the anti-Semites hate these people? Why? They're the same as, they're, they're the, for all practical purposes, they're the same as the anti-Semites. Okay. Um, 
the religious Jews we can understand. The religious Jews are different, but the non-religious Jews, the assimilated Jews, the German Jew, the even a blonde, blue, blue-eyed German Jew, Hitler went and and found in his blood that his father's father was Jewish. Maybe even he's not Jewish according to Jewish law. No, you're Jewish, Hitler says. I'm going to kill you anyway. What's going on over here? And the Jews yes. themselves, what, what, why are people, they don't understand why people are persecuting them. They don't even understand their Jewish identity. They may say, well, I'm Jewish only culturally. What does culturally mean? I eat Jewish food. But, well, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish food is not the same as Iraqi Jewish food. And uh, re- Iraqi Jewish food is more similar to Iraqi non-Jewish food, right? Yeah. Um, if one of the most popular food you go to an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood uh, today is probably pizza and sushi. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's very confusing for people, and it was a it was a very big problem, a very big problem. If, and then if I, if I that... may, may just come with with a parallel, I I noticed uh, I I moved out of Iraq in 1991. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I personally, I wanted to kind of come out of the country. I was only 20. I wanted to come out of the country and take upon me a new identity. I wanted to be this kind of person who, who moved to Europe and became somehow European. <laughs> and I think to some extent, I felt that I succeeded until 9, 9-11. At the time of 9-11, there was a very strong sense of anti-Arabs, anti-Muslims. And I think that really drove the the kind of the community in Europe and maybe in America. I don't kind of I don't really know community in America, but in mm-hmm. Europe, I I found that many more people started to define themselves as Muslims because they were kind of addressed as Muslims because they were hated as Muslims because they were rejected as Muslims. Not because they were believers, not because they observed five times of prayer a day, not because they fasted the whole of Ramadan, but because there was this sentiment that was against them. So when when you are met with the sentiment that comes against you, it becomes a normal reaction to somehow hold on to your identity, even if it is just this identity that is defined by Hitler, whoever whoever Hitler kills is a Jew. And then excellent, uh, yes, but in such a case, the Muslim cleric, the imam, is going to define Muslim differently than this Muslim that just defines themselves as a Muslim, even though they don't believe in the Quran or in Muhammad. It's yes, they're true. creating a new definition of Muslim, and a religious Muslim is going to say to this guy, You're not really a Muslim, you're a kefir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, now we're beginning to understand what's happening here. So there are various different questions and answers that people were asking in this confusing time. The Jews who are suddenly not religious are being persecuted as Jews. It's weird. It was strange. And long story short, came the Zionists and said, look, we're going to settle this whole thing. In the days of nationalism, where nationalism was an actual identity for people, uh, it used to be in be before nationalism. Let's say you were a, you're in, you're an Englishman. You weren't really an Englishman. You were a subject of King Egbert, and you fought wars for King Egbert. But there wasn't something intrinsically an Englishman. It, nationalism created a new identity for people. The nation is the is the unit. And the people are cells in the unit and various nationalist philosophies. And there were actual philosophers that had these philosophies of nationalism, had various different ideas of what a nation state is and what the difference between a nation and the people. There was, let's say, we'll talk, we'll call liberal nationalism like we have here in the United States of America. We don't really believe there's something intrinsic or racial or even ethnic about being an American. Now, being an American is a, a commitment to living in America, and it's kind of like a corporation. Uh, the government helps us, payment for services rendered. We pay taxes. We hire our president and our Congress, and they represent us. And it's it's and in return for this corporate 
behavior, this corporate structure, if people in California are attacked, if they're bombed, the people in New York will come to defend them. It's like a team, right? But there's nothing intrinsic about being American. I, all the way on the other hand, you have the other side of the spectrum, you have these organic ethnic nationalists that believe, let's take, well, we, we're an Aryan nation, the Germans, right? Well, there's something intrinsic, racial even, about being a German. And there are all sorts of gradations in between. So these nationalist philosophers, these things were, these, these ideas were running around in those days that the Jews were having this identity crisis and came the Zionists and said, I'm solving all the problems. We're going to solve your identity crisis. We're going to solve the problem of anti-Semitism. We're going to make sense out of all of this. The Jews are going to become a nationality. The Jews, you want to know what the Jew is? There's French people. There's Italian people. There's going to be Jewish people. They're going to be in that set of people. And we're going to unite ourselves. How? Right? We said, what unites the Ethiopian Jew with the German Jew? Well, they're going to have a common language, a common culture, a common land. We're going to speak Ivrit, modern Hebrew. That's going to be the Jewish language. And they made sure to the best they can that specifically they wanted the Ashkenazi Jews for uh, to buy into this. They didn't care much about the Ethiopian Jews because when you create a nationality, they set out to create a new identity, a new nationality, and they had their own idea, a picture of what that new nationality type of person is. Imagine you have one of these, I don't know, uh, children's books, and it describes uh, United Nations or all the different types of people in the world. You'll have an Italian guy, a Japanese guy, you know, these little pictures, and they'll all have a certain look and a certain clothing, right? They had an idea of what they wanted the Jews to become. They wanted the Jews to become, you know what? Now this is Jabotinsky's theory. The Jews should become the opposite of what they are now. We're going to set out to create a people. He, he literally said this. When Herzl died in 1904, he made a eulogy on Herzl, and he said the, Herzl's greatness was that he was the opposite of an old-time Jew. They blamed the anti-Semitism on the, on the old-time Jews. They said, of course people are going to be anti-Semites. Jews are disgusting. Now, you're going to ask me, but they, they, were, they attacked non-disgusting Jews as well? That's because... People are confused about what a Jew is, and they always associate us with these old-time Jews. We're going to make a new definition of Jew, new type of Jew. Like in your example of the Muslims, imagine the Muslims in America are going to say, you know what, the reason why people attack the world, uh, Muslims after the World Trade Center is because all the Muslims, the religious Muslims, the Muslims that believe in the Quran, the Muslims that believe in Muhammad, they're all, they're all being blamed uh, because they're like Osama bin Laden. We're making a new definition of Muslim. Muslim has nothing to do with anything religious. Muslim has to do with, okay, we're going to get a Muslim language. There are different languages that the Muslims have. We're going to make a language. Let's say we're going to pick, we're going to make a new one, modern Aramaic, modern Aramaic. Yeah. We're going to make new words. In fact, we're going to use the old holy words uh, and we're going to change them into political concepts. We're going to take a word, they did this, the Zionists, there's a word teku that describes a rabbinic uh, legal question that's unresolved. And today in Israel, it means a tie in a soccer game. Mm -hmm. We're going to, we want to in fact transform the religious Muslims and make, make them see the light and make them become like us. This... Please try again. I, I, this... I can hear you. All this, all this Islam stuff and this Muslim stuff, all of this stuff, that's got to go. You know what? Theoretically, even you can keep it. But right now, it's not possible to be a Muslim like uh, a religious Muslim and a modern Muslim. So you guys got to change things. We're going to become the spokesman for all Muslims in the world. And we're going to explain to the world that those guys are an aberration. The Muslims are really an ummah. Now, the yeah. Muslims have a word, Uma, but Uma yes. doesn't mean what it means now in Islam. Uma means like a French people. We're going to have a flag. We're going to have a national anthem. We're going to have a country. We're going to have a language. We're going to have a culture. And that's Uma. 
and uh, I'll prove it to you because Muslims have a concept of Ummah. That's yes. what they did to the Jews. The Jews have a concept, Am. Um, we also have a word, Ummah, but it's mostly, which means society more than political nation. Yeah. No, we're an Am. Am Yisrael, the nation of, of the Jews. That means we're a nationality. Like the French, we're going to get a flag. So they made a flag for the Jews. Jews never had a flag. They made a language for the Jews. And it was all a transformation project, a social engineering project that they figured as soon as Theodore Herzl wrote this, as, as soon as Zionism gets off the ground, anti-Semitism will disappear off the earth and the Jews will be transformed from ugly, disgusting, weak people to normal people. That was the goal of Zionism. Yeah. The, but they didn't want to just become a new nationality. Let's go back to the, my Muslim analogy. Most Muslims, let's say, wouldn't agree with this nonsense, these kefirs. What's plural of kefir in, in Arabic? Do you know? Kufar. Say that again? Kufar. Kufar. Okay. Kufar. All these kufar, uh, nobody really wants to be part of them. Yeah. So what they need to do is they need to gaslight the regular Muslims and convince them to join their project. So here's what they'll do. They'll say, look, Muslims, there's a lot of Islamophobia now after 9-11. We're going to protect you. We're going to arm you. You don't have to join. You don't have to like us. We're kufar, but we're going to protect you. We're going to make you, we, we're going to have connections with the politicians. You guys st st stay with your studying and your praying and stuff like that. And we'll take care of the security and safety. And we're going to bring you honor, right? And I'm sure there are maybe a lot of religious Muslims that may fall for that. Well, and there, there, are, there are definitely, I mean, such a group actually exists, like a group of people who also want to assimilate and also want to, and also see Islam as kind of, ugly and, and not worthy and uh, you know that that group exists it's only that they are not that successful yet <laughs> now here's what i'm going to do let's go let's I, I like this we're doing well with this muslim analogy okay this theoretical this situation so now here's what they're going to do these kufar they're going to say okay we need to make an educational system we have to have new educational systems for the muslims they have a lot of money these kufar much more than the scholarly Muslims and the religious Muslims. They're going to offer educational uh, 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 financing. Only one thing you have to do, teach the history of Islam and all Islamophobia that existed. Just teach about Islamophobia. Never again after 9-11, after never again. We're not going to allow this to happen again. And maybe there were massacres that happen to Muslims, however it is, teach about them. And not only that, but the goal the goal is going to be these kufar make being hated part of your front and center of your consciousness and more. Make it part of your identity. Whoever the Islamophobes say is a Muslim, that's the definition of a Muslim, not somebody who follows a prophet. Whoever the Islamophobes hate, that's a Muslim. And our we're going to bring you to the sites where Muslims were killed, Islamophobic, and we're going to have kids go there, like they bring people to Auschwitz, and and they're going to they're going to cry, and at the end they're going to come out with the flag of the Ummah. That's the last chapter. We're going to write books about the history of Islamophobia. Of course, it's all going to be distorted and and uh, caricatured, but that's the main thing. We have to emphasize Islamophobia and how the solution to Islamophobia is this new country that we're going to make. We're going to make a new country that's going to be not only a Muslim country or an Arab country like Saudi Arabia or uh, UAE. No, this, what America is to the Americans, what Italy is to the Italians, we're going to make a, give me a name for a Mus for the Muslim country. Well, I don't give know. me a name. Okay, we'll call it Islamstan. Okay? okay, Islamstan is going to be to the Muslims. A Muslim doesn't no, no longer going to mean the member of a religion. It's going to be, your identity is going to be a national. Islamstan is the state of the Muslims, and every Muslim is its constituents the same way an Italian belongs to Italy. Yes. We're going to change the identity. You want to be religious? Fine. You want to, It's better if you're not, because it'll be easier for you to accept what I say. But theoretically, if you can accept my ideology and still be a religious Muslim, I don't care. If you want to fight in my army 
Uh, and we're going to be the spokesman, of course, for you guys, because and we're going to go to the world. We're going to go to the world. Say, look, these Muslims, they're traumatized. Uh, the definition, we're going to write history books. And we're going to tell everybody in the world that these Muslims, they're traumatized. Just look at them. They sit on the floor praying, what, five times a day? That's not normal. We're normal Muslims. They, because of Islamophobia, uh, uh, Ali just explained it. They, they had this weird... Uh, uniting factors and this is what they came up with but now we're going to make them normal again we're going to make them normal again we're going to get them a country we're going to get them an identity we're going to get them an army and this army is going to protect from islamophobia and anybody we're going to teach everybody that the whole world is against the muslims and anybody that uh, that that is against this country obviously this is the most moral country in the world is against is an islamophobe and you teach them since they're little kids yeah. that we teach them since they're little kids that that Islamophobia is your identity and that this country is what's not only what's saving you from it, it's what's saving you from yourself. This is your identity. OK, this is an idea of what Zionism is. So to, to recap, Rabbi Shapiro, so uh, um, so just so that I, I know that I've understood what you have kind of told me so far, uh, a Jew is someone who who was with Moses uh, in either in spirit or in body or in both um, around Mount, Mount Sinai, God appeared to the Jews and they accepted the Mishvahs, the 613 commandments, and they were obligated for life by these commandments. And that is the definition of a Jew, someone who believes in God and adheres to what God wants from the person. And then Zionism is, is a nationalist movement that somehow tried to liberate Jews from themselves. Exactly. Um, so, so it wanted to make the Jews the modern people who were more scientific, who were more successful, who were more who were stronger, more beautiful, uh, more kind of dressed in a normal way, don't don't have don't have the keeper on their head and uh, don't have a beard. But you can. You they don't care if you have a keep on a head and a beard as long as you believe that the Jews are a nationality and that Israel is the state of that nationality. You see, back in the olden days, all religious Jews knew that you couldn't be religious and a Zionist together. With very few exceptions. So the Zionists had to do things like force Jews to be non-religious. There were the Yemenite children, you know, who they, there was a court case in Israel where they actually kidnapped Yemenite children. There's mounting evidence pretty clear already. They, they did this. They kidnapped Yemenite children and sold them and told the parents the children died. The See, the Zionists have this idea, remember, of what a, a Jew should be, and Yemenites are not in the picture. They have to balance this, that they need to maintain this facade that Jews were always a nationality, um, which means they can't say that we're creating a new identity. They're saying we're regaining our old identity by rewriting Jewish history and, and rewriting uh, Jewish religion even. At the same time, they only want Jews that that fit their picture of what a Jew is. Guys like uh, the Ashkenazi, like Ariel Sharon or Netanyahu. So I'll give you an example, a legal example, where there's a distinction. So according to Israel's law of return, if you're born Jewish, you can become an Israeli citizen, Right. What if you're not religious? You're an atheist. You can still become an Israeli citizen because being a Jew has nothing to do with religion. But what if you're born Jewish and you practice Christianity? You say, I'm converting to Christianity or Islam or some other religion. Guess why? You're not Jewish according to the law of return. Right. Which makes no sense. But the reason they did this is because they don't want a bunch of Jews walking around with robes and crosses around their neck. That's not what a Jew is. That's not what they wanted to be. Yes, I Zionism was created to save the Zionists from Judaism, 
from Jewishness. And they're not looking for a, you know, a bunch of Jews with a with a church because they just, that's not what they want. They're not looking for a bunch of Jews that pray, you know, on their knees what five times a day. They, they're not looking for that. Yes. They wanted to be a certain way. They had a target for their identity, for their reputation, um, for what what everybody sees them as. And they, it's like, you know, that old story, the old archer that shoots the arrow and then draws the target around yeah, it. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what they did. They said, this is what we want. We're going to draw the target around our desire. And we don't want to be these, these we don't want to be the Muslims. We want to be like, like an Ashkenazi, enlightened, strong, the opposite of Jews. Jews don't like wars. We are against war, according to the Jewish religion. Um Wars are, are bad, and the war stories in the Bible we interpret differently than the movies do. In the movies, King David is a uh, is portrayed. I don't know, like a, a guy who looks like uh, Tarzan with a Jewish beard and um, sword and a shield, leading a army of Hebrews. No, we portray him. We look at him as a pious rabbi, and God fought for him. You know, King David wrote the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, he's now there's a king with an army, and yet he wrote this whole book, and often in Psalms he speaks about his enemies. But he never says things that kings say. In other words, such things as, I would like the heads of my enemies on spikes. I would like, I'm the strongest guy in the world. I'm, I'm going to kill everybody. I mean, he never speaks like that. Whenever he speaks about his enemy, God save me from my enemies. It's always God save me, God save me, God help me, God help me. And, and there's one place in the book of Psalms that's really the theme of the Jewish people. I'll say it in Hebrew and then I'll translate it because it's easier for me to remember in Hebrew. <laughs> one thing King David says, I will request of God. And he's talking to God. It is only that I will ask. I will ask nothing else. Colon. Shivti Bevais Hashem Kolime Chayai to sit in the house of God all my life. Lachzois Benoim Hashem to uh, bask in the splendor of God, Ulavakar Behecholoi, and to consistently visit God's domain. That's it. That is mm. King David's one request. And that's the theme of the Jewish people. The Zionists hated that. They wanted King David to be Conan the Barbarian. They wanted the Jews to be the Vikings, um, yeah. but Judaic Vikings. They And that's what they tried to do, to make a society that is the opposite of the Jews. Now, these Yemenite Jews, who are pretty much all religious, uh, right? Or the Iraqi Jews, who once upon a time were all religious. Your Iraqi friend, his parents or grandparents were religious, for sure. Yes. All of these people, that's not what they wanted. They didn't want religious Jews. They didn't want Christian Jews, although there were Zionists, actually. Israel Zangville, uh, I believe it was, who said that when the Jews become a nationality, we will have the Omar Mosque being guarded by Jews who practice Islam. And the Holy Sepulchre will be guarded by Jews who practice Christianity. There was there was all sorts of different ideas that the original Zionists had because they were creating a nationality and identity out of nothing. Yes. So there you could, you know, in the planning stages, you can have different brainstorming ideas. And yes. they did. Yeah. The dominant idea of Zionism was to have the Ashkenazi strongman who, and don't forget, here's the problem, that their identity itself is they still can't define what a Jew is. It makes no sense to say that an atheist is a Jew, but uh, if because he's born Jewish, but the same guy who practices, who believes Jesus is the Messiah is not. It makes no sense. Imagine a Jew, um, a guy born Jewish, going to apply to for the law of return for Israel. There actually was. There was a Supreme Court case. The guy's name was Father, it was Brother, Brother Daniel Refusion, a Carmelite monk. Uh, the Supreme Court said, because you believe in Christianity, you're not Jewish. Now, he could have said, you know what? All right, 
I, I'm an atheist. Oh, now you're Jewish enough. Fine. Now yes. you're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Zionism is a synthetic, contradictory, um, intellectually inconsistent identity. And it works because they always have the adrenaline flowing part of their identity. In fact, uh, for many of them, it is the main part of their identity is the anti-Semites hate us. That's what makes me Jewish. And therefore, yeah. uh, Israel, Israel is not the same to the Jews. You asked at the beginning, if you say something against Saudi Arabia, that doesn't make you an Islamophobe. That's because Saudi Arabia isn't the country of all the Muslims. Israel is claims to be the country of all the Jews in the same sense that America is the country of the Americans and Italy is the country of the Italians. Yeah. And that's why, this is not me saying this, Netanyahu said this in his book, this is Avigdor Lieberman on Israel's website. This is why they say, and if you're, you're against Israel, you are anti-Semitic because just as you cannot have, you cannot say, I don't want Italy to exist. You can't say I'm, I'm for the Italian nationality. If you're against Italy's existence, you're against the Italian nationality. So too, if you're against Israel's existence, you're against the Jewish nationality. And since Jews are only a nationality, then you're against the existence of Jews. Without Israel, there are no Jews. That's the idea. Yes. Now, the truth of the matter is that if that would be true, there'll be nothing wrong with being anti-Semitic because I, you're allowed to be against the national identity. I was, a, I'm sure everybody, a lot of people didn't want the Soviet Union to exist, right? Just yeah. change, become something else. Yeah. So if you want, uh, that doesn't mean you have anything, it's nothing immoral. I say, I don't want the Soviet Union to exist. I don't want the Soviet identity to exist. I want yeah. you to be Russians, right? Or something else. Yeah. I don't, I, that's not a problem. The problem here though, that they're, they're mixing in the, organic identity with a national identity. So they they take the fact that Jews are always persecuted and there's something intrinsic about a Jew and the Jews have died for being Jews throughout the generations. Remember, this is like front and center of their consciousness. And all of this means Israel. Israel is what Jewish identity is all about. That's yeah. Israel. And they take a very, very ethnic, a very organic type of nationalism yeah. that the people I mean, are like interesting you know rabbi shapira like I, I, as you are speaking I, I i thought that if i was now to say that i am anti-nationhood so i i reject all nations i don't want a nation that wouldn't make me anti any type of people but if i was to say i am anti this one nation or yes. or opposing so... this one nation then that makes me an anti-semite no, it doesn't. Well, that's what they say. Yeah, but... no, so that is what they say, you know. But... Yes, that is what they say, that if you oppose the existence of the state of Israel, that you oppose the existence of Jews. And opposing the existence of Jews is immoral. Now, the problem is, if they would be right that Israel is what creates the Jew, then there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't want Jews. Because the Jew, being a Jew is the same as being a Soviet. It's the same as being uh, a communist. It's an ideology. Uh, there's nothing wrong with me saying I don't want Czechoslovakia to exist. I think Czechoslovakia should not exist. I have nothing against the people. Soviet Russia is a good example. I don't want Soviet Russia to exist. USSR, it's the fact that it exists is bad. Instead, it should change to something else. I don't have nothing, anything against the people. I don't want to harm the people. On the contrary, I think it's better for the people if a Soviet uh, ideology and communism would not exist. Let's say I believe that, okay? Let's say I think North Korea should not exist, right? So I think that it should become something else. I think it should become part of South Korea, for example, all right? And the people, it'll be better for the North Koreans. But you see, what they do is they say, okay, no, anti Semitism is bad. They start with that assumption, which is true. And then they say, oh, now the reason anti-Semitism is bad is because being Jewish is not an ideology, it's not a philosophy, it's not a 
po a political position. It's not even a political status. It's intrinsic, right? Yes. So, yes. but they want to change the definition of a Jew to a political status, a constituent of a certain political entity, meaning Israel. Yeah. And now they want the word anti-Semite to retain its immoral status and yet change the definition of Jew to a political status. So yes. you, they, they want both together. And the reason this works in people's minds is because Jewish identity is anyway so confusing and anti-Semitism is so confusing that any tangible uh, explanation, even if it doesn't really make sense, any tangible identity that they provide, and they do provide a tangible identity, you don't matter a country, an army, a history, all of it is synthetic, but yes. it's tangible, it's accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're worried. And, and on top of that, the world has a history of trying to annihilate the Jews. There's yes. all this anti-Semitism, and, yeah. and they're brought up from when they were a kid like that. So, yeah. of course, if somebody doesn't want Israel to exist, then what is Israel? Israel's just the salvation of the Jews in all the Holocaust studies books. It's a binary version of history. Binary means there's Holocaust, pogroms, degradation, disgusting life ghettos and then on the other hand the other side there's israel it's yes. either or yes anybody yes. that doesn't want israel obviously they hate jews obviously yeah. they hate jews yes. now you're going to tell me well what do you mean israel should be giving giving equal rights to people right and if you give equal rights to people then israel as it is now is not the jewish state anymore but but well no wait 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 you want for your purposes to, something should happen to Israel that will erase Jewish identity. It will also leave the Jews defenseless. Without Israel, you have Hitler. You want Hitler for whatever purposes you think. Yeah, maybe Israel's doing bad things sometimes. I, every country can do bad things. Yeah. But if you fix it the way you want to fix it, Hitler comes back. You don't obviously don't care about that, right? You don't yeah. care if Jews get thrown into concentration camps. So clearly we know what that makes you. At the same time, that's from a utilitarian practical uh, perspective, from a identity perspective, uh, you also don't want the Jews to exist because you want to get rid of Israel. And without Israel, there is no Jewish identity. And therefore, yes. obviously, you, you're you one of the many people throughout history that said, yeah, 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 we, we like the Jews until we decide to throw them into the ovens. That's yes. obviously what's happening. Rabbi Shapiro, may I ask you, have you ever been labeled as a self-hating Jew? Because well, self-hating Jew is not a big deal. Um, that's mm -hmm. not really a label that. So, like people like really Noam Chomsky, I have like... been labeled. No, I have been labeled a Hamas supporter. Uh, people have said, "Sure, um, a Hamas supporter for going on for going on this podcast over here." They're mm -hmm. going to say there are people who will say that I encourage Hamas because obviously Ali, he's a Muslim and or a Gnostic, or but he's Iraqi, he's Arabic, right? He's Arabic. And therefore, uh, he wants to kill the Jews. And by me saying that Israel is different than Judaism, you're clearly giving ammunition to Hamas to kill people. Obviously, Hamas wouldn't kill people if not for yeah. you, Yaakov Shapiro. So you're encouraging right. Hamas. Also, it's been said, I should, people say this, that I, I get paid by Iran. I'm an Iranian, um, or either Hamas or Iran, yes. that's who yes. pays me. The anti-Semites love me. I encourage the anti-Semites. Uh, the truth of the matter is the anti-Semites hate me because the anti-Semites, they actually, there are different types of anti-Semites. There are some anti-Semites who will, uh, regardless of whether Israel's right or wrong, they'll say Israel's wrong because they don't like Jews and they're very happy when Israel does bad things because then they can, they can extrapolate to say all Jews. I, my job over here is to say just the opposite. Yeah. Don't blame the Jews for what Israel does. And I don't want credit for what they do. I'm not even saying if they're doing something right or wrong. All I'm saying is that the Jews have nothing, Israel has nothing to do with the Jews. It's a completely different definition, like we said before about the Muslims. Your, your kufr are going to make a new definition of Muslim with a Muslim flag and a Muslim ummah. And then they're going to say that we represent all the Muslims in the world. But the religious Muslims are going to say, no, those guys have nothing to do with us. Now, does that mean that you want these people killed or hurt? Of course not. I have, I, I never, that's one of the reasons I never speak about Israeli politics, because I want to emphasize the fact that 
the issue over here is not, okay, there are Jews that are against Israel. That's not the point. I'm sure that Israel's against me. That's really uh, more accurate. The, the, the point over here is that, in fact, it's a trap. If anybody, I, I say this all the time, looks for Jews that are against Israel and they say, well, look, there are even some Jews against Israel. You're promoting Zionism by doing that. Because Israel is the country of the Israelis, not the country of the Jews. That's the fact. Yeah. They say they're the country of the Jews. There is not a single country in the world like Israel. That every other country is the country of its citizens. Israel is the country of the Jews. And that's really what the, the Palestinians the Palestinians agree that the problem is that they want a democracy for all Israelis as opposed to, I'm not talking about the, the, you know, the ones that want a Palestinian state and get rid of all the Jews. I'm not talking about yeah, them. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the Mayor Kahana. Okay, no one's going to accuse him of being an anti-Semite. Mayor Kahana, or, or anti-Zionist, said that you cannot have a Jewish state and a democracy both together. John Kerry said that. That's really the fact. It's just that Kahana said that the conclusion has to be, let it be a Jewish state. But if you have a democracy, you don't have a Jewish state. I agree with him. Mayor Kahana was right about this. See that? Yaakov Shapiro agrees with Mayor Kahana about that. But whereas it makes him a Zionist, um, they're going to say, I'm the Hamas supporter yeah. because I don't want Israel. You see? And the problem is that if somebody says, look, there are Jews like Queen Rania of, um, of, of Jordan. Jordan. She, she said uh, she was interviewed by CNN and she did, a very, she did a very good job. And she said that you could be pro-Palestinian and not pro-Hamas. You could be pro-Jew and not pro-Zionist. One has nothing to do with the other. And she said there are plenty of Jews that are appalled by what Israel's doing. She made a mistake there. There are plenty of Jews appalled by what Israel's doing, but that's not why being anti-Zionist is not being anti-Semitic. The truth is there are plenty of Jews, plenty of non-Jews who are appalled. There are also plenty of Jews and non-Jews who support what Israel's doing. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is that what Israel's doing has nothing to do with what the Jews are doing any more than what China is doing has to do with what the Jews are doing. I, I Israel is a completely. different Jewish identity. When they say Jew and I say Jew, they are homonyms, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, when, like when I say, I don't know what, when a photographer says F-16 and a fighter, uh, Air Force uh, fighter pilot says F-16, they're saying the same words, but they mean two different things. Yes, when course. a musician says he has a gig and a, a, data, uh, a data scientist says a gig, they're saying the same word, but they mean two different things. When I say Jew, and when Israel says they're the Jewish state, they mean two different things. Israel claims yeah. to be my state. It's a lie. It's not. That's all, all that I is, want everybody to know. That is why Israel definitions has nothing are so to do important. with the Jews. Definitions, that is why definitions are so important. I was uh, I actually, I, I just wanted to comment about you saying that you going on this podcast, you would be kind of labeled... I don't know, Hamas supporter. Uh -huh. I, I have to tell you that before I contacted you, even even yesterday evening, I, I did get a bit of kind of cold feet. And, and I thought to myself, in this time, when there is a war going on and there is kind of support for the Palestinians, and me, Mr. Nobody, who, who lives in Norway, the Iraqi exiled, uh, interviews a Jewish rabbi, uh, I'm going to be labeled by many people, many things. Um, so let me tell those people, whoever is going to label you, I'm talking to you guys now. I have nothing to do with Israel. I'm an American. And you guys that are labeling Ali, I don't know what, uh, uh, genocide supporter? Uh, uh, no, you guys no, I, I would be labeled as a Zionist. I would a be Zionist. Labeled, so you yeah. guys who are labeling him a Zionist, you're the Zionists, not him. And here's why. If you think that a, by interviewing a Jew in America, a religious Jew, whose family was from Poland, mine was, hundreds of years my family was in Poland, okay, until uh, right before the Holocaust. I have nothing to do with Israel. Zero. Zionism, I am the biggest anti-Zionist that you're going to meet. 
if you meet somebody else that's equal to me, then they can also see things straight. But you're, I am not a Zionist. I have nothing to do with Israel. I, whether Israel is doing, when they're doing the right thing, when they're doing the wrong thing, or all the times in between, it has nothing to do with me. If you, you, who, are, who, who claim that interviewing somebody like me means you're supporting Israel's politics, you are a Zionist, because what you are saying is that a Jew in America automatically is associated with Israel, and that is the definition of Zionism. Okay, Thank did you. I do good, Ali, for you, friend? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I I just kind of, you know, I, I, I actually wanted to kind of also clarify this issue with self-hating Jews. So a self-hating Jew is this label that is applied to many kind of Jewish intele intellectuals. I mean, now there is a bit of confusion about the definition of Jews. So someone like Chomsky is probably not a Jew because he's not really believing. Well, he's uh, in the sense that he's obligated to believe that means that he's Jewish to me, yes. but he won't be able to um, explain what his Jewishness yes, is. Yes, but he's labeled as an anti-Jew anti, anti -Jew or a self-hating Jew, sorry, sure. uh, because he, he supports kind of the Palestinians, he criticizes the state of Israel, then he's a self-hating Jew. Now, how would you actually classify the Zionists? Are they self-hating Jews or are they not Jews because they are not not Zionism actually practicing. Is idol, Zionism is idol worship, according to the Jewish religion. Okay. It's a changing of the Jewish identity. And long story short, as I, the definition, the word Jew, well, in the sense that we use it, right, um, means, or well, the Jewish identity means the job given by God. And the job given by God are only those things that God said to do. If you throw into your Jewish identity something mundane that doesn't have to do with God, what you're doing is you're adding into Jewishness some form of physicality, some politics or something. And that, long story short, is idol worship in the Jewish religion. Now, there were Orthodox Jews in the days of the Bible that were also idol worshippers. They would wake up in the morning, pray to God, put on their tefillin, eat kosher food, and then worship the Baal, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. So you can have Orthodox Jews that are idol worshippers, and they are doing that in Israel today, a lot of Orthodox Zionists. There are those who are plain idol worshippers who are atheists. Yeah. There are all sorts of things. But Zionism, the ideology, is against Judaism. It's a different religion. That's what I would say. It's very simple. Um, people come to me all the time. And your friends, your friends, those people who would label you as Zionists would come to you because they associate me with the Orthodox Jews in Israel. In fact, today in the government, for the first time in like ever, there are so many people, ministers that wearing yarmulkes, not the same as mine, but uh, also a yarmulke. You're talking about uh, these guys like Ben Gvir, Smotrich, these characters. Yes. Now, I have nothing to do with them. Asking me about the Zionists would be similar, uh, a similar exercise to asking the Pope about the Christian Zionists. The Pope would say, I'm Catholic. They're Protestant. Why are you asking me? I have nothing to do with those guys. It's not my religion. It's a different, even though they're both Christians, but it's two different religions for all practical purposes, right? Yes. It depends yes. on how you're going to define it. So it's same thing over here. You can't ask me about Zionist Orthodox Jews, even though, yes, it's both Orthodox Judaism. That's like saying Catholicism and evangelical Christians are both Christians. So go to the Pope and let him explain. I, I can't explain to you somebody else's religion. I do know that it's another religion and I've studied it and it's not Judaism. There is a lot of overlap, just like between the Christians, the Catholics and the evangelicals. There is overlap, right? Yes, yes. There's a lot of common beliefs. But there are places where the beliefs separate. Yeah. And the same thing with us. Zionism is not Judaism. To Judaism, Zionism is a different religion. Now, you could practice that different religion exclusively. You could be half Zionist practicing half Judaism. You could be practicing it in the way that, uh, you know, listen, Jews and Muslims both believe in the same God. 
the necessary existence, first cause, etc. But there obviously there <laughs> it branches out very quickly and becomes two religions. Orthodox Jewish people like me and Zionists, even Orthodox Jews, we do share some beliefs. Uh, one of the beliefs is, which we is the first cause of necessary existence is God, uh, that there is there's reward and punishment. There's all sorts of things that we share, but but there are plenty of things that we don't, yes. right? Yes, and to the point where it's it's idol worship. It's not my religion. Zionism is not my religion. It's a different religion. And... I, um, I, I, I just kind of, you know, I, I, I have really kind of learned a lot, Rabbi Shapiro. I, I want to kind of, I, I, you know, for me, this, this kind of session. I hope you would be available for a different session, but you know, I don't want to take too much of your time as well. Um, I would like to ask you about the Holy Land and mm -hmm. the Promised Land from, from like a, a biblical Jewish perspective. Um, so there are people in Israel who say our mandate is the Bible, and Ben Gurion uh, said that, and 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 that that is kind of very clearly. I mean, for someone who doesn't believe in in God, but actually believes that the mandate is the Bible, and specifically there is this reference to the land being promised to the Jews. So what is kind of what is the promised land? seen from your um, belief? The land was promised to Abraham's descendants, yes. However, these promise, such a promise, our tradition tells us, is conditional and it depends on many things. There are times and places when the land is appropriate for us to be in, and there are times and places when it's not. Just as there are different days of the week, there's Sabbath and weekdays where different uh, Judaism is expressed differently, right? There are times of year, uh, there are holidays that are holier and it requires different type of uh, expression of Judaism. We have different duties, different commandments, right? Different laws. There are also different times throughout history where uh, there's different expressions of Judaism. And by that, I mean that Judaism is fulfilled in different ways. There was a time when there was a temple when the purpose of Judaism, the purpose of, the, of God giving the Torah uh, to the world was fulfilled in certain ways. And there was a temple once upon a time. And when there was a temple, it was appropriate to bring animal sacrifices. It was appropriate, sometimes it was appropriate to have a king of the Jews. And the truth is that was really a concession. As the Bible says, the Jews really should not have asked for a king. God should be the king, but it was a concession. After you ask for a king, then they had a king and there are laws of how to treat kings. Bottom line, there's different times, places. And nowadays by Jewish law, we do not have, Jews do not have sovereignty over the Holy Land. Even in the days of the temple, the Jews did not have sovereignty. The second temple, the Romans did. It was part of the Roman Empire. Um, there was a, a rebellion of Bar Kokhba, which ended up in a disaster. But sovereignty has nothing to do with the Holy Land. The Holy Land is holy. Which means that it's like a synagogue. But just because a synagogue is holy doesn't mean it has to be under Jewish sovereignty. You have a whole, you have a synagogue in Iraq, and once upon a time in Bovel, the major Jewish uh, uh, academies were there. Pumbedisa, Nahardo, Sura, they were on the bank of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in these big cities. But sovereignty and holiness are two completely different things. There is... Right now, yes, promised to the Jews, but it was promised that it will come to the Jews under certain circumstances, under certain places, and to certain Jews, non-religious Jews, who don't care about what we promised to do 
for God really have no business uh, invoking what God promised for the Jews. Our, our responsibility is to worry about what we promised God at Mount Sinai. We will do and we will listen. If somebody doesn't care about what, we, what, what he promised God, then it's a joke for him to invoke what God promised the Jews. Ben-Gurion was the one that said, the whole quote was, the mandate, the British mandate, the mandate is not our Bible. The Bible is our mandate. Yeah, That was the whole quote. Yeah. But he also said he does not believe that in the God of the Bible. He does not believe God spoke to the prophets. He didn't believe in our God. So this is just one more contradictory um, part of Zionism. A, a guy like Netanyahu, who is completely unobservant, meaning he doesn't eat kosher food, he doesn't keep the, the Jewish Sabbath. And even when he speaks about the Bible, like recently his Amalek thing or uh, other times he's invoked the Bible, these are not Jewish interpretations at all. I do know that usually they're evangelical Christ Christian interpretations. If you want to understand Netanyahu's uh, ideas about the Bible, his understanding of the Bible, you need to ask a evangelical uh, pastor more than a rabbi because they'll have more of a handle on it. I do know that Netanyahu, when he quotes the Bible, when he quotes, he has no idea what he's talking about. And it, it a sixth grade yeshiva student knows more uh, about Judaism than he does. And... He, he's completely unobservant. He's a non-believer, a kofer. And he's just saying this usually to... He got the he gets his information usually from the evangelicals, not from rabbis. And I can, I can give you examples um, where he used actual evangelical uh, exegesis of the Bible, uh, not Jewish ones. But this is not to be taken seriously. You know, it's like if you try to make sense out of the Zionists, a guy like Netanyahu invoking a biblical passage, a Bible that he doesn't believe in, a Bible that he doesn't fulfill, it's not going to make any sense because Zionism is inherently contradictory, artificial. So here's just one more contradiction. There is, I always call it artificial Jewish flavoring and artificial Jewish coloring in Zionism. They want it to look Jewish or to sound Jewish or to feel Jewish, but it, it really isn't. It's like the difference between a cherry flavored jelly belly versus the real fruit, a cherry. Yes. It may taste similar, but it doesn't have the nutrition. It's not real. And Zionism, really, it should not, I get, it's offensive to Jews to associate Zionism with Judaism. It's a different religion totally, different interpretation of the Bible, a different look at the Bible. To me, the Bible is real. God spoke to prophets, He Jews came out of Egypt, Moses split the Red Sea, all of that is real. To them, it's a joke. And it's just, it's just a, it's a treasure house of symbols, feelings, slogans, and a way to supercharge nationalism with some, some godless religious fuel. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned idol worshiping. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I I really kind of you know your uh, your comment that we should uh, we should not worry about what God promised us, but we should worry about what we promised God. Right, God is going I, to give us what He promised us I, when it makes sense. I, you know, I, it's like you know, it's like it's like if you promise some, you promise your kid a car, right? That doesn't mean your kid. He can take the car that you promised him when he's 10 years old. It doesn't mean he can take it without driving lessons. The promise doesn't mean it is yours always and forever. The promise means 
that in the right time, in the right place, under the right conditions, I will give you the car. Whatever God promised us, he will give. Not a bunch of non-believing Jews, anti-Semitic Jews, a bunch of people that mock Judaism and want to replace it with some nationalist thing, not something that these guys go and, and take with an army. That's not, nothing to do with God. You, you know, don't blame God for what human beings do. That's the first rule. Secondly, Zionism invokes the Bible, it invokes God, mostly for the evangelicals, not for the Jews. Mostly, because the evangelicals are more, there are more evangelicals than there are uh, Jews here in America, and they are more, they are more powerful, more politically uh, influential, and they have more money. So he, he really panders to them. They're a very important ally to Israel. It's just that we're being used as human shields. You know, if Netanyahu doesn't want or other Jews that call me, say I'm a, supporting Hamas by uh, being on this podcast, if they don't want me to tell people, and there's no reason why not, but if they don't want me to tell people that uh, Judaism is not Zionism, then they need to stop telling everybody that Israel's the Jewish state. Then Israel needs to stop calling itself the... I'm not obligated to sit here and anti-Semitism is growing and I should just let it grow and not do anything about it. If somebody accused me of being a, uh, I don't know what, a, a Ukrainian and there are Russians beating up Ukrainians in the street, I am going to go say, no, I'm not Ukrainian. And if there are people beating up Jews because of what Israel does, I'm going to go around saying, no, we're not Israelis, leave us alone. So that, that's for them. Anti-Semites hate me. David Duke, you know who he is? Yeah, yeah. He wrote an article about me, and he said, nobody should believe Rabbi Shapiro. It's not true. Jews are Zionists. Anti-Semites want Jews to be Zionists. Anti-Semites want Jews to be associated with Israel. Anti-Semites love this. Anti-Semites love Zionists. I mean, they of love course. to hate them. They love them because... They love it, that they exist, so then they can blame all the Jews on, on, the, on everything they have against Zionism. Anti-Semites, and these Zionists are brainwashed into thinking that, and, and it was, it was Ber Borachov in the olden days, and more recently Menachem Begin, it's their idea. No, all Jews need to stick together and rally behind Israel and support Israel. That way, the anti-Semites will hurt us less. But if we break ranks, we're divided, then the anti-Semites uh, are going to hurt us more. The truth is, I'm not breaking ranks. All I'm doing is I'm saying, you know what, leave me alone. I have nothing to do with Israel. I'm not Israeli. It's not the Jews that are what breaking ranks. They broke ranks. They created a country. They have nothing to do with the Jews. This is Israel. It's not the Jews. It, if you assume Zionism is true, that Israel is the state of the Jews, and all Jews are connected to Israel, because that really was what Zionism is. Zionism says Israel is the state of the Jews. Without Zionism, Israel is the state of the Israelis. It's that simple. It's nothing complicated about this. Yes. Israel is not a democracy. It's the state of the Jews. Um, they can claim it's a democracy also, but I'm on Mayor Kahana's side and John Kerry's side. It can't be both. That's uh, I, And go accuse Mayor Kahana of being an anti-Semite if you want. They um, won't because he was a Zionist. You, you, the, spoke, you spoke in my defense for, for me saying that I would be accused of being a Zionist for interviewing you. I, I'm not going to do the same and kind of speak on your behalf. But I, I truly believe that radical movements such as Hamas or terrorist groups, they would not have existed had it been that the world was actually dominated by figures like you, Rabbi Shapiro. I, I agree with you. I, I hope you're right, actually. And I will tell you, uh, Israel, Zionism, radical Zionists are not the same as radical Jews. It's radical Zionism. Zionism is not Judaism, whether you like them. And again, I... I, I Cannot understate, I cannot overstate this. 
the idea that if you don't like what Israel's doing, to say, well, don't blame all the Jews on Israel. There are radical movements everywhere. It is not a radical Jewish movement. It's not radical Judaism. Yeah. It's radical Judaism would be excessively passive. Yes. Pacifistic. Yeah. That's what it would be. There is no uh, and and uh, militant Judaism would be an oxymoron. But it's not even Judaism. They're not using Judaism. They're using Zionism. You you asked me when we spoke before if uh, the rabbis would be running Israel and if we were running according to Judaism, what would it look like? Well, it wouldn't look like anything. It wouldn't be Israel. <laughs> they would. The first thing they would do is they would say, all right, guys, let's find a way to make this into a normal country like America. It wouldn't be Israel. Israel is a Zionist country, not a Jewish country. They claim it is. They claim it represents the Jews. The same way in my uh, analogy, in my imaginary case, your uh, Kefir, your Kafur Muslims uh, would say they represent all the Muslims and the other idea of what Muslim identity is is all wrong. It Zionism is against Judaism. I I really have no way to fix this, but the the language is wrong when we say I'm an anti-Zionist. It's more accurate to say Zionism is against me. Saying I'm an anti-Zionist is like saying I'm an anti-Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. I'm they're anti me. All I, I, <laughs> all I want is for them to leave me alone. Just stop calling yourself the Jewish state. Stop associating with all the Jews. Just say you're Israel. Be a normal country like all other countries. That's all I'm asking you. I'm not even getting myself involved in. Look, there's a court case about Israel's actions. There was a court case in California, a federal judge in America. I'm not even getting involved in Israel's politics. I'm not saying anything about it. Why? I don't want to. I don't want people to think that Jews are obligated or to get involved in Israel's politics, or even that Jews who do yeah. get involved in Israel's politics, that it's more meaningful than if a non-Jew does. Now, you're going to ask me, but they're doing what they're doing in my name. So my answer is yes, I disavow them. They have not, the, not that I don't like what this particular thing they're doing. They have no standing to speak in my name. They're the Chinese acting in my name. Oh, and yeah. the natural reaction to the Chinese saying they represent all Jews is to say, you don't represent all Jews. I don't need to go if the Chinese saying that they're persecuting Uyghur, Uyghur Muslims in the name of all Jews. I don't need to go say, no, I support the Uyghur Muslims. I need to say they're crazy. I, I, Israel is not going right. to drag me into some political brouhaha because they go around impersonating something called a Jewish state. I'm sorry. I, I am I, allowed to choose my human rights issues that I get involved in. Yeah. And I now you then so now the uh, there are going to be pro Palestinian people say ha see you don't care about the Palestinians I'm not saying that don't force me to get involved in your issue because I'm Jewish I have nothing to do with Israel Israel has nothing to do with me any any attempt to make Jews get involved on whatever side is by definition associating Jews because they're Jews with what Israel does, that is Zionism. The proper anti-Zionist response is to say, Israel has as much connection with me as China does. Yes. That doesn't mean that well, I agree less. with what Israel does in the slightest. It doesn't mean I disagree with what Israel does. Yeah. It's two completely different things. If I say China's not the Jewish state, it doesn't mean I agree or disagree with what they, what they do. Israel yeah. has no more to, to do with me than China does. I mean, I, I have to sympathize, Rabbi Shapiro. I remember on 9-11, on I was in my 30s. I, I had a longer beard. I was doing a PhD, and I kind of wanted to impersonate this kind of uh, scientist figure. And so I had a longer beard, and it was black. And the picture of bin Laden came out, and I looked at it, and I thought, oh, this guy looks like me a little bit. And the first thing I did was I went home, and I shaved clean. Uh, and since then, you know, many people have asked me, how is it that the terrorist, the Muslim terrorists think? And the, the idea is that somehow I am inside me a terrorist who can actually then explain how terrorists think. 
And and I'm I'm like you. I would like to say these terrorists, they have nothing to do with me. It's even China. I'm wearing Chinese clothes. It has something to do with me. But these people really don't represent me. And you see, Ali, you're not even Muslim. Yeah, of course. Yeah, see, yeah. so so that's that's what we're talking about here. You you could say, you know what? Not only am I not a terrorist, I'm not Muslim. My name is Ali, and probably you get a lot of people assuming you're Muslim because that's yeah. But that unfortunately that doesn't help because you know stupidity is is the overriding issue here. That's right. And now, what if the Muslims let let let's let's talk this out? What if Osama bin Laden would say he represents all the Muslims and uh, and all the Gnostics also? You would say. I have nothing to do. Osama bin Laden's nuts. Yeah. I have nothing to do with him. And and Gnosticism and, and Islam are two completely separate religions, right? Yes. Um, one has nothing to do with the other. And I don't care how many times he says it. Don't you asking me, you would be entitled to say, to to come out against Osama bin Laden is actually supporting Osama bin Laden's assertion that he's in charge of the Gnostics. Because why yeah, should yeah. somebody ask you as a Gnostic to come out against Osama bin Laden? By the same token, so, somebody asking me as a Jew to come out against Israel is the exact same thing. They are supporting Israel's assertion that they are the country of the Jews. Yes. They are not. And that disclaimer, that disavowal is more than enough. On the contrary, the Zionists are so happy when even with those Jews that are pro-Palestinian, the Zionists are happy because what it means is that, and no, uh, let me rephrase that. The Jews who showcase their own Jewishness and raise their hand and see even I, a Jew, believe the uh, are pro-Palestinian. The Zionists are happy when the, those guys do it. Palestinians are also happy, I, I, I grant you, Yes, because they don't really understand this dynamic either because they're not experts of Judaism and Zionism. But the Zionists are happy about it because if an American Jew, I'm not talking about Israeli, an American Jew does that, what he is saying, besides that he's pro-Palestinian, is that Israel is the country of the Jews. When you say even a Jew, yes, to say no, even I, an Israeli, that, that would make sense, right? Yes, but, but isn't isn't that at, at its heart somehow a rejection of of one's individualism? Like I I have to be seen in the eyes of others as belonging to a group, as if well, I am. Well, you do or don't belong to a group. In other words, whether you belong to a group is either true or false. I'm left-handed. I'm American. I'm Jewish. Those are groups. Those are facts. I have yeah. a family, so I do belong to groups. Uh, ethics does not demand that I deny the fact that I'm a citizen of a certain country, I'm a follower of a certain religion, I have certain biological characteristics, I'm left-handed, black hair, uh, brown eyes, that's a group, right? Yeah. Um, being in a group is not a contradiction to ethics. There are, how you look at a group um, may may or may not be. But being in a group is just either fact or fiction. Yeah, but you know, like I'm, I'm kind of, for example, if 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 someone comes and says my father is imprisoned because he was a thief, you know, that doesn't in itself get you to think, oh, you must be a thief too, or or if someone that... says my great grandfather killed someone, that doesn't so get you to think, at, okay, so then you are also a criminal. Right. But so in, in this talking... case, because you belong to a group, which is a much wider thing than a family, and yeah. someone in that group happens to be, say, a terrorist, then you are also labeled as a terrorist. Right. That's not right. That's not denying the group. The, the solution to that is not to deny the existence of the group. The solution to that is to understand it's just fact that I'm not responsible for what somebody else does. Now, if if, let's say, my group, let's say the guy is a terrorist because of a certain ideology that the group shares, and that's what motivated him to be a terrorist, 
like let's say you have an anarchists club yeah and one anarchist commits a crime then if you're looking for another if you look if you're you're the fbi you're the police and you're looking because he's an anarchist he committed the crime now if you're the police the and another crime was committed and you're looking for a suspect you will look at the anarchists because motive they have a motive that doesn't mean they committed the crime but it means they will be suspect yeah so profiling it's profiling right profiling yeah. is not is a scientific uh, thing if it's done properly but if a guy commits a crime has nothing to do with a common belief like if i'm left-handed and somebody else is left-handed and he commits a crime that doesn't mean i'm more likely to commit the same crime but if we're anarchists or we're let's say a street gang right let's say we're a street gang and somebody in the gang uh or, or, uh, killed somebody and then there was somebody and you know that gang a doesn't like gang b and somebody else in gang B was killed, you're going to the police. The first thing they're going to do is, okay, who were his enemies? Well, that was gang A. And then they're going to question every member of that gang. Not yeah. accuse, but yeah. they're going to question. So if, if somebody thinks that Israel is doing a bad thing because they're following Judaism, then all Jews are going to be suspect. And it would be the it would be the job, the logical response of Jews to say, they're not doing it. First of all, I didn't do nothing. Second, besides that, they're not doing it because they're following Judaism. We're not in the same gang. You think I'm a member of that gang, but I'm not. It's two mm -hmm. completely different gangs. He says I'm a member. I deny it. I have nothing to do with him. Netanyahu goes around talking about Amalek. And by the way, even the Israeli judge in the ICJ voted that these guys need to stop uh, talking like this. They, that's not Judaism. Yes. That's yeah, what but, he you said, know, had I mean, nothing to do with Judaism. I, I don't know what religion it was. I Maybe mean, it's his own religion, but it's not Judaism. Nothing to do with it. It's not an extreme version of Judaism. Yeah. It is a completely different million miles away from anything that any Jew would understand in the Bible. I, I fully understand, though. I mean, it is a complex. Like, I've heard many people on TV, you know, in, in, in Europe and America, and they come with this claim that says not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists happen to be Muslims. That's not even true, by the way. A lot and, of people think that. But yeah. they don't even remember that the, what was it, the PFLJ, they were Christians. And there, there are plenty of Christian uh, terrorists or, or other religions. It's not true. And besides, the, what are they, how many, one have billion Muslims in the world? Yes. They're, they're, it doesn't mean that a Muslim is suspect of being a terrorist. There are all sorts, you know. And again, that's like Christians, there's evangelicals, there's um, Protestants, there's, when you say Muslim, that doesn't really mean much. The difference between Muslim A and Muslim B, even beliefs in beliefs could be so wide, so yes, different, it's almost two religions, right? Yeah, Shia, yeah. Sunnis. and So the fear of being labeled a Hamas supporter goes so deep amongst the Jews and the actual indoctrination that says that in order to protect Jews in Israel, everybody has to stand by Israel. Otherwise, anti-Semites are going to come, which is an illogical stand. But because that's so ingrained, the Menachem Begin attitude, the Bar Barachov attitude. So even, I mean, now it's not merely Israel claiming to represent the Jews and Jews need to say we have nothing to do with Israel. That's been going on for years. Today, it's worse. Today, because of Netanyahu mentions Amalek or other people mention Promised Land, what's happening is people are blaming not only the Jews because of their uh, alleged association with Israel, 
They're blaming Judaism. They're blaming my religion for this. And people are asking me, people are asking me all over the place. I've been on other podcasts. What's the real explanation of Amalek? What is he? And the truth of the matter is, I sh because this guy made up his own religion and his own interpretation of the Bible, why am I answerable for it? And, and because he's Jewish. You see, there it is. It yes. is more important now for Jews to be able to say, every Jew should say, if any Jews are listening to this, Jews should say, we are not Israelis. We have nothing to do with Israel. You can have a position, whatever you want. You can have your own politics. But the idea that Jews are responsible for what Israel does, or that Israel speaks for the Jews, or that Israel is the Jewish state, false. You must disavow that. But more, if you're a religious Jew, you must tell people, if you if you have the opportunity, that the biblical verses that the Zionists are invoking have nothing to do with the religion of Judaism. They're nothing. There are missionaries on the streets that try to, Christian missionaries, that try to convince me Jesus is the Messiah by invoking verses of the Bible. That's the way it works, right? And there are Muslims who, if I would meet them, let's say, in Hyde Park, they may come over to me and try to convince me that Islam is uh, the real religion and not Judaism based on verses of the Bible. It's not my interpretation of the Bible. Netanyahu's talking about the Bible is no more associated to me or no more closer to my interpretation than the Christian missionaries trying to convince me that Jesus is the Messiah. So yeah. if somebody would come to me and say, look, it says in your Bible that Jesus is the Messiah. How do you, uh, what do you think of what this missionary says? I would say, no, it's completely two different religions, two different ways of looking at the Bible, two completely different interpretations. Whatever he said is based on suppositions that I, I say are false, an interpretation that I say is false, have nothing to do with it. Netanyahu's invoking Amalek is no more Jewish than a Christian missionary invoking Isaiah 52 or 53, I forget offhand, to prove Jesus is the Messiah. Yes. It's that simple. Yeah. I mean, I you know, one, one thing that I, I've often kind of thought about, it's like when you see these uh, these killings, say, 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 say some kid in America goes into the school and shoots 50, 50 people. Mm -hmm. Or or even like there was this uh, a uh, guy, the Norwegian, who killed about 70 young people in an right. island outside uh, outside Oslo. When these things happen, it's never the nation never reflects on itself and says, oh, there must be something wrong with us. It's always, oh, this is a one individual who has made up their own mind about one idea, and maybe there is a group of them, but it, that doesn't involve everyone. I would have many times liked to be treated like that. You know, some some terrorist goes and blows up something and I am treated that this has nothing to do with this guy. Or, uh, you know, Netanyahu claims something from the Bible and it's clear to everyone that this has nothing to do with Judaism. This is about this one person saying It's not this. clear to everyone. See, that's but it's not, problem. yes. Yeah, I know. See, it, it's more than... It's true, which is obviously it's very true and very important that if an individual does something, you shouldn't blame a nation. But over here, on top of that, it's not the same nation. Yes, yes. It, it's like, you're right. If somebody in uh, Norway would do a bad thing, you can't blame all the Norwegians. But what if a guy's Chinese and you come over to the guy and say, you're a Norwegian. I'm blaming all the Norwegians for what this Norwegian did. Yes. <laughs> the first, by, by blaming me, Jews, for what Netanyahu did, it's not merely that if one guy does something, the others in his group are not responsible. We're not in his group. That's what I want to make clear. Yes, and his I interpretation am. of the Bible, it's dangerous to Jews because there are bad people out there that will blame all the Norwegians if one guy in Norway does something. And there are bad people out there, bad people who will blame all Jews for what Israel does in the same way they'll blame all Norwegians. But even the bad people won't blame a Chinese person for what somebody does in Norway. Yes. And if you're a Chinese person and people think you're Norwegian, you're going to tell all these bad actors, I'm not Norwegian. Leave me alone. I'm, I'm not yes, committed. Yes. I'm not telling you if the guy in Norway did something bad or good or if everybody in Norway is responsible. I don't know. I'm not involved in this. When Netanyahu invokes the Bible or even when Israel does something, not only 
am I not responsible as a, another member of the same group? I am not in his group. Oh, Jews yes, need to sir. explain that. Yes, his I interpretation understand. of the Bible is literally no more Jewish than the Christian's interpretation of the Bible, where they derive that Jesus is the Messiah. They want that interpretation, that's theirs. Yes. But nobody's going to come to me as a Jew and think that I agree with that interpretation. Even if you, even if you say all people in the group do agree with an interpretation, no one's going to come to me and say, because let's say uh, ISIS, uh, maybe it would invoke a biblical verse from the Old Testament, let's say, right? Nobody would come to me and ask me, well, why, how do you explain what ISIS did? Well, they're a different religion. Yes. I'm not a member of the same group. Yeah. Not only is Netanyahu responsible for Netanyahu says nobody else, but not only that, I am not a member of his group. I am an American Jew. My family's from Poland. Mm -hmm. I practice Orthodox Judaism. None of those things. Uh, Netanyahu is Israeli with the religion he practices is Zionism. Maybe if he practices any religion, certainly not Judaism and his interpretations of the Bible are not Jewish. I don't know what religion they are. You would need to ask him, but you ask me, they are as disconnected to me as irrelevant to me, as foreign to me as the verses that the Christians from which the Christians derive Jesus is the Messiah. Rabbi Shapiro, I came to you for counsel, and I, you know, at just now, I, I do, I do believe that your soul was somehow with Moses around Mount Sinai. You are truly a wonderful human being, and uh, I have learned a lot from you, and lots of my confusion has has been kind of evaporated through talking to you and through listening to your other lectures. And, and I'm really, really grateful. I would love to talk to you much more, but I'm sure that you are also just now tired. Um, if, if, if at one point you would like to kind of speak more, I would absolutely love to talk to you more. It's, it's wonderful that there are people like you around. It's wonderful that you are speaking out. I think you made it very clear that, you know, if, if a Chinese person is doing something or an Iraqi, this has nothing to do with Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro. Um, it's a different group. It's a different ideology. It's, it has nothing to do with invoking one verse of, of a text that to you is from God and to them is not really a sacred book. Thank you so much for the kind words. I really appreciate your having me. Thank you very much. Bye.